Hey guys, this is Tom Bogert, and you're watching Rave Green TV. Hello everybody and welcome back to Rave Green TV. And for today's video, we're going to be joined by the main man himself, the MLS journalist, Tom Boger. He has become the source when it comes to transfers, rumors, or anything in between. He's the man that knows it all. In today's video, we're going to discuss the Seattle Sounders transfer business during this offseason, the players that they've bought and sold, some possible areas of concern that the team might need to address with new purchases, outgoing transfers, and what we think should be the goals or objectives for this team for the upcoming season. And I mustn't forget to give a big shout out to our Patreon members that gave me questions in today's video. And if you guys want to be a part of these videos, ask your questions to our special guests, make sure to be subscribed to our Patreon. The link is always in the description. But without further ado, let's jump into this video. So to get started, Tom, let's begin by discussing the Sounders transfer window because you are the transfer man when it comes to MLS. So why would we not talk about it? Just to highlight some of the ins and outs for the Sounders during this offseason, we saw Della Vega, Musovsky, Bell, Nathan as the big names that came in for the Sounders with departures of Ladero, Eber, Sissoko, Cleveland, Doppelaire, Rowe, and possibly Montero. Montero's been flirting on social media on and off if, he, if he's going to come back or not. So that one's still up in the air, but it's not like a crucial player if he does come back or doesn't come back. It's just if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. But when it comes to the transfer business, what's your thoughts on it? And like kind of what would you give it a grading like if you were in school? Um, I think I'd go B plus and that could very easily become A or higher if if De La Vega is worth the fee, if he makes an immediate very big difference. So I try not to confuse busyness with being great, right? Like quantity versus quality. I don't think that Seattle should be charged in this like grading system because they brought back literally every starter from their playoffs. Like again, Nico Ladero, club legend. I think he probably should have been starting by the game against LAFC, but that's just my opinion. The fact is all 11 starters from the last playoff game in which they believe that they outplayed LAFC are all back on the team. So everything that they've done is additive. Again, like I, I, I stress that I love Nico Ladero. He's going to be somebody to replace. But by the playoffs, he was not a starter. Pedro de la Vega, even if he doesn't start, their view is we're still really good. It's gonna like they they believe highly in him. They think he's gonna be very good. But it's not like they're pinning their hopes on him because a front three of you know Jordan Morris, Kristen Rodan, uh, Leo Chu, sorry, front four then whatever whatever it breaks out with with Rusnak there, like they don't necessarily need de la Vega to be in their best eleven. Again, you use a DB spot, you spend that money particularly for a team that I don't think is going to have a ton of like discretionary transfer fee to spend in the future. They it's very important that they hit, but for 2024, they're going to be very good whether De La Vega is good or not immediately. Outside of that, Danny Musowski, I think was a, a phenomenal advantageous signing, opportunistic signing. It's weird. Like when I look at my depth chart, I think I kind of have him listed as the third forward because I think opening day, it'd be Jordan Morris up top with Leo Chu in the wing. And then Raul Ruiz Diaz is Raul Ruiz Diaz. You can't drop him the third choice, right? When he's fit. Uh, I think Musasi is going to get a ton of minutes. And everywhere he's been, MLS, USL, whatever, he scores goals when he's on the field. And in this team, they're not going to ask him to do a ton in like the buildup. They're just going to ask him, man, be goal dangerous, be good against the ball, make good runs. And I think this is a perfect fit for him. So the high level signing, what make this team could be the best team in the league if Pedro de la Vega is a legitimate difference maker pretty early or at least like through midseason. They're going to be very good high floor, even if he's not. So that's kind of where I'm at with their offseason. Do you think that the moves that they made were the right moves? Because I don't know, for me, from what I'm hearing from you, there's some underlying slight concerns, like with how you talked about how they brought back the same team as last year. Yes, the Sounders finished in second, but in my point of view, even as a Sounders fan, I don't think we outplayed LAFC. I think they came in with a tactic. I think they came with an approach that we're not going to have much of the ball. We know we're only going to have one or two chances, and we luckily have a guy like Buanga and Vela, who even though Vela wasn't at his best last year, the reality was they didn't give up really any clear-cut chances at LAFC. So that's what I'm saying. They came with a plan, and I think Sounders just kind of did what they have done all of last year, where they beat the teams that they should, but whenever they came up against a challenging opponent, they didn't, they were toothless basically. And so do you think that was a good idea that they kept majority of the team? Because yes, it has been successful, but like they're getting older. You're seeing that there's some deficiencies from certain players. Yeah, th I think that's a really good and fair point, right? Like, so again, the people I spoke to at Seattle think that they outplayed LAFC. I think there's a real good argument to say LAFC 
knew what they were doing and they knew that they had the high-end individual talent of Denny Buanga to break the game in transition. And hey, like we don't need to have 10 chances. We don't need to dominate possession, right? This is, this is the best for us. That's my worry with Seattle is the elite attacking talent. I think Jordan Morris is very good. I think Christian Roldan is one of the most valuable players in the league. I don't think that they have a uh, like, well, they definitely don't have a Denny Buanga. And again, that's not fair. There's not many Denny Buangas in the league in the world. They don't have prime Nico Ladero, prime Raul Ruiz Diaz, where when, when things get bogged down, like, you know, you can get a special moment. And maybe that's Pedro de la Vega. And I'm trying to be cautious in that it's not fair to expect that. From, like, he's not he's not a failed signing if he doesn't turn into Nico Ladero, right? Like, club legend, one of the best players ever, one of the best signings in this league history. But that's my big worry about the Sounders is that high high floor low ceiling like that's if if things don't work out that's going to be their issue yeah that's something i'm a little bit worried about as well because delavega is still relatively young but i feel like because he's the only big name that they've brought in and the only big name that they've brought in since Rusnak back in 2021 when you think about it there's a lot of pressure and people might think oh he'll easily hit like a 12 goal season but like, I think you have to adjust what you're hoping for from him to not add too much pressure on him. And so what were some areas that you felt that the Sounders needed to address that they didn't address during this offseason in regards to purchases and sales? So ins and outs. Yeah, I think that they're sitting on a on a golden goose of allocation money with Javi Arriaga. Last year, I was asking the question to sources like, I'm sure teams are calling for him because he's a very good center back and it's clear he became second choice at Jackson Reagan. Okay, who like, and it's like, hey, we don't want to trade him because then we need to get a good center back back. And like, there goes the value. Uh, but then they signed Jonathan Bell and Nathan this winter. Like, I th- look, if Kamal Miller was 800,000, right? Javier Yaga has got to be somewhere around there, give or take, right? Like, I don't know exactly how their contracts line up, but they're similar enough players, I think. So they could... They're sitting on allocation money that they could be getting. And obviously, the longer that he's on the bench, the less his value is. The closer he gets to his contract expiring, the less his value is. So I'm surprised about that. Maybe they're waiting for teams to get a little bit desperate. But I don't know, man. Like, how many teams in MLS could use a starting level center back? <laughs> 18 of them? <laughs> like So um, it's a little bit surprising to me that they ha- that hasn't happened. And again, I don't know if that means it's the offers haven't come in. Or if that's Seattle just saying, no, 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 we really value him as our third center back. Because... I think that with Be- between Bell and Nathan, they have a third center back and they could get some allocation money here for Ariaga. But again, this is just nitpicking, right? Like, I don't think that it's reasonable to expect with the, the all they had was a young DP spot. It's not reasonable to expect that you're going to replace Nico Ladero one for one with the young DP spot. So like, that's why I'm, I, I'm trying really hard to be careful with De La Vega, because again, it's like, if he's not Ladero, that doesn't mean he sucks. It doesn't mean he's a bad signing. But like, both things can be true that like, yeah. And also if they don't have somebody turn into um, an elite level player, it's going to be a problem. And De La Vega, just because of, we we know the ceilings on the other attackers. We know what Jordan Morris is really good at and where maybe he's not quite Buanga. We know where Raul Rui Diaz is with his legs. We know where Albert Rusnak is and like, he's a really good 10, but he, he's not an elite 10. He played eight, right? Whatever, all of this. So De La Vega is, I think, the only one who you could realistically say, hey, he could be elite. And again, if he's not, that that's, doesn't mean he's a bad signing but it's just that's the only thing this team is missing and if you want to spin that positive you say well that means the team's really good you know an area that i'm surprised you didn't bring up was the striker position because for me personally that's the position i think many fans and myself felt was the biggest area of concern obviously i'm not like you i don't know the ins and outs even after watching your glorious video talking about gam tam and all that stuff it's tough to fully understand roster rules and what the gms have to deal with but an area of concern i think we all can agree with you kind of hinted at it a little bit was the striker position and i think that is what hurt the sounders in those moments of you know you create so many opportunities you create so many half chances but you have no one that has that killer instinct to consistently score goals yes morris i think ever since he's been in the league since 2016 he's always had moments flashes of hot streaks but he also equally has moments of cold streaks and with Rui Diaz his main issue has never been being good his issue has always been getting hurt but it seems like those injuries have caught up to him now to the point where you're having as many injuries as you're having goals in a season that's not good and so I think many fans were hoping for the like a new forward possibly yes they brought in Musovski but I think you get what I'm trying to say at someone that was the guy a big big name like what Rui Diaz was back in 2018 and obviously as I was talking about with the roster stuff Rui Diaz only had one year on his deal 
was it going to happen that you could get a deal for him? Probably not. But do you feel that they did need to bring in a forward? And if since they, they're probably not going to be bringing anyone in at the remainder of this window, could we possibly see it happen during the summertime? Yeah, I mean, the only way that could happen is if Rui Diaz leaves, which again, it, it, I, I know that you're not suggesting that they're going to get some sort of big fee or anything like him leaving would be that they just don't have to pay out the rest of his contract, right? Like, and again, maybe over the first half of the season, his legs are back and everything else. But I think that that would be a little bit silly to, you know, depend on or rely on. That's why I kind of have Jordan Morris as the starting center forward, because like, I don't think that you can really rely on Raul Rui Diaz at this point with all the injuries. And to your point, Jordan Morris, I think, is a phenomenal secondary scoring option. When like, it's not his game to be the Raul Rui Diaz number nine. It's not his game to be, I don't know, just just kind of going out to any other like Yorgos Yakimakis. Like Jordan Morris does a whole lot in transition in the buildup again. Like when he plays on the wing, like an inside forward. I think that's best when you have a Rui Diaz as a center forward. But so the argument would have been instead of targeting De La Vega, which what they prioritized this winter was a potentially difference making signing with that young DP spot that can eliminate players on the dribble because they didn't think that they had enough of that when teams did what LAFC did and just sat back. Or it was, do you try to get a young DP center forward, which it's difficult to get consistent production from young players in general, but particularly young center forward. You think NYCFC just signed Jovan Mjadovic. He's not a young DP, he's a U22 initiative, but same concept. Eight and a half million dollar transfer. 18 years old, he looks awesome. I think he's going to be really good. But can you win a title with an 18-year-old center forward in his first year coming to MLS? Like, maybe, but it's very difficult. And maybe they'd be in the same spot right now. Because I don't think that there's a sure thing when you have a young DP spot when you're trying to sign a center forward. Hell, Charlotte are trying to sign the kid Luciano Rodriguez. He's a wonder kid, Uruguayan Youth International, next big thing. I th- like if they get that deal over the line, even if it's a fifteen million dollar transfer. If if I'm sitting here being like, either he score he scores twenty goals and has five assists, or he's a bust. Like that's not fair for a nineteen year old, twenty year old, whatever he is, right? Like so, even if they use their young DP spot on a center forward, I think we'd still be having the same conversation. I'm certain that they have DP number nine targets. Teams plan windows in advance. They try to plan for even things you can't plan for, like. Columbus crew didn't want to lose Lucas El Rayon last summer. They were ready to sign Diego Rossi within two days because they were like, when, if slash when he leaves, we're ready. Like the smartest teams, the best planning teams. And, and I think Seattle are in that bucket. They have uh, a left back signing if new who leaves. They have a center back signing. If, if, if Jackson Reagan, if, if offer comes in, they can't reject. Right. So I know that they have DP nine targets, but I think it's much more a case of Rui Diaz coming in the summer and being like, Hey, I'm not playing much. I get it. Um, there's this offer in Mexico, like just free transfer and and whatever. We'll take a buyout, whatever it is, right? I think it would be more like that than Seattle coming to Rui Diaz and saying, hey, we're going to buy you out because we need to sign somebody else. Again, I think it has more to do with the departure first than the signing. To kind of wrap up the video, because, you know, this video, I don't know exactly when it'll be out, but it's going to be out for sure before the opening day matches. For this upcoming season, I want you and me, as two kind gentlemen as we are, to talk about what do we think the objectives and the goals are for the Sounders. Basically, we're doing a little mini preview of what the, in our point of views, what the goals have to be for the Sounders for this upcoming season. And obviously, I'll let you go first because you're the guest. So Trophies. This club is about trophies. This team is at this the stage of its evolution where, just like the last few years, they chase trophies. Again, like, I try to, I, again, and maybe it sounds like a loser mentality, that I try to not be binary and, like, Look, you need you need to be really good, but you also need a little bit of luck to win any trophy. So even if they don't win a trophy, I don't see it as a big failure, but like they should be in the conversation for all these things. If they finish seventh in the West and lose in the first round, if they finish, if they go into leagues, uh, yeah, sorry, leagues cup and are out within the first knockout round, like that's a disappointment, right? But if they're get if they're going deep in all these competitions, if they're challenging towards the top of the West in the regular season, uh, Champions Cup, all that, like that's a good season for me. But again, like. If I was a fan, I'd be probably saying trophy or bust. But for me, as somebody who's uh, a little bit forgiving, particularly when you're looking at the whole landscape, there's 29 teams vying for four trophies. Probably three because Liga MX wins the CONCACAF Champions Cup so much. So um, I just I like the the idea of trophy or bust is one that I'm, I don't feel so comfortable saying all the time. But again, if I... If I was a fan, that's probably where I'd be sitting at. I think I, I'm actually quite in the same boat as you, not in regards to trophy or bust. I want to look at it in progression because I think since the Sounders won the CONCACAF Champions League, we have seen they haven't quite been that ruthless team like in years past. When you look at them in MLS well, that year after they won the CCL, in you know Leagues Cup, in, in the Open Cup, 
in supporter shield races in when they were even in the club world cup and all these tournaments and in the playoffs they're getting knocked out really early on they're not in that latter stage pool and i think what's important i want to see this season is this team being able to make deeper runs for brian to prioritize hey like regardless even if it is the open cup like let's take it a bit more seriously than going 5-4 against san diego loyal I actually show that this team still has that, you know, that magic, that special sauce that they can still go on and win trophies because the Sounders were a historic team in winning trophies early on, open cups, and then supporter shields, whatever it may be. And then when Brian came in, he was the one that got the hump over in MLS cups. And now I want to see, does Brian still have that magic? Because part of me is thinking he's kind of lost it a little bit, in my opinion. We haven't seen him being able to, because like, honestly, last year in every cup competition, I think the Sounders were terrible. I mean, in League's Cup, they 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 played awful. They didn't win a single game. They got thrashed in both matches. Granted, their group was tough, but they weren't in the they weren't in it. Open Cup, they lost to a struggling Galaxy team at the time. Club World Cup, I understand that's a whole new avenue, but there was definitely an opportunity on the table, especially when you're going nil nil with about 85 minutes left. There's an opportunity there, and as well in the playoffs. Yes, you beat Dallas, but I don't think anyone was worried for the most part, that Dallas would upset the Sounders. But then when you go up against your first challenging opponent in LAFC, we saw the typical Sounders we saw throughout the regular season. So for me, I think I I want to just see that progression of, okay, does this team still have that magic of being able to make deep runs in tournaments to possibly get close to winning a trophy? I'm not saying trophy or bust. I know, Tom, you're not saying that either because it's not as black and white as that, in my opinion. Yeah, and and again, like it's so tough to continue evolving, to continue can continue to again reestablish yourself over new eras and and even if it's similar players like you know Morris Ladero Ruiz Diaz have been here for a while but last year was clearly a different version of Ladero and Ruiz Diaz right like and and this it, it's very difficult to continue to get that juice to go again and go again and go again um for me like again cup competitions is it sounds stupid but Bruce Arena has always said it like your best players have to be your best players LAFC Buanga was their best player he won that game for them again like that LAFC beat Seattle because one team had Buanga and the other didn't. Um, so I think that all of these things are tied together. And that's why, like, I, I I really think that there's a chance that Seattle, they probably wouldn't be a dark horse for the Shield because that would be, like, disrespectful to consider them a dark. Because, again, like, I think everybody knows they're really good. But they have the advantage of the East is so much stronger than the West. So if the East is beaten up on each other, if Seattle are consistent earlier in the season, particularly with, with Champions Cup and everything that happens in the beginning of the season for MLS, like if they put together a good first, you know, 10 to 12 games, like they have a legitimate chance to win the Shield because their road will be easier than Miami, Columbus, Atlanta, Philly, all these teams having to, to play against each other. So that's kind of where I'd be looking in terms of trophies. And like maybe that just dovetails into my assessment of the team that it's it's the collective is really, really strong. But they don't have a Bulanga. They don't have a Messi. Nobody has a Messi. But right, like they don't have that one singular talent that like ah, it's nil nil in the 60th minute. Like somebody bail us out. Like again, like these these are all players that I really really like and really respect. But like I don't think you can just go like put your hands on your knees and roll the ball and put it in space for Morris and be like, yep, thousand percent he's going to score this uh th this quarter of a chance that he's going to get. Or all right, Rusnak under under pressure with two men around you. Like oh again. Like, I think these players are phenomenal. I'll say it again about Christian Rodon. I think that he's one of the most valuable players in the league. Um, but it, it's just not in their nature to be like, hey, roll the ball to Christian, beat two players and, and shoot, right? Like, and that that's nothing wrong with that. I think that's one of the reasons why I love him so much because he can do so many things well. Um, but again, in a playoff game, small sample sizes where individual moments and luck have an outsized importance in those comp competitions. That's why I like them better in, in like the shield race because I think this team is so, so good. But their only drawback for me is the like lack of like top end talent. But we'll find out. We'll, we'll see what happens with the Sounders. But nonetheless, Tom, I wanted to say thank you so much for coming on, for giving us your opinions, your thoughts, all in the in between. And hopefully again in the near future, we'll see you come on for another video. Yeah, yeah. I owe you. I, we, we had the expectations wrong in time to timing. So I definitely owe you for another one. Uh, for, for people listening out there who don't know, you have helped me with some tips on my own YouTube channel because I'm crap at... <laughs> <laughs> the technological side of things and you've helped you've uh you've thrown me some some thumbnails you've thrown me some tips so 
So yeah, I definitely owe you another half hour after this at some point, and I appreciate that. I want, I want to make sure that people know. Well, boys and girls, that's going to be the end of today's video. Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comments down below. Let me know what you guys thought about the stuff that Tom and I discussed in this video. Let me know any other guests you'd like to see on this channel. And shout out to our Patreon members, Zach Bartkus, Hernan Gonzalez, Aldo Hernandez, Scott Ran with Scissors, Nathan Goody, Derek Ramirez, and Anish. If you guys want to be a part of the Patreon, there's always a link down in the description, but boys and girls, I hope you'll have a lovely day.